I can't remember at the time we talked, did I mention, you know, my plans for the company at all or, 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 or not? No. You did, I didn't even tell you that I was planning on starting a company. No. Fascinating. Radio. 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 The sound waves produced by the announcer are picked up by the microphone. This is American Life from Ira Glass. I'm Alex Bloomberg. I'm Terry Gross. This is NPR. Radio waves are sent out in all directions. Studio 360. Jan Abelrod. Robert Krulwich. I'm Roman Mars. Let us follow through the steps and the processes in transmitting or sending radio messages. So, so you've been thinking about that. Maybe you've been That's so funny. <laughs> The radio messages leave the antenna as electromagnetic waves and travel out into space with the speed of light. Hello, and welcome to Radio Waves. I'm Kevin Kaners. Well, if you've been following my guest today, Alex Bloomberg, to really any degree, you'll probably know that he's had a pretty incredible year. Since last August, not only did he create Gimlet Media, a brand new podcasting company, but he also became the host of a hit new podcast of his own, Startup, an appropriately meta podcast documenting his journey as he starts well, a new podcasting company. But until recently, and for more than 15 years, Alex was better known as a producer at This American Life. Now, there's many different forms that a story at This American Life can take, from profound to the whimsical, but what tied together much of Alex's work there was his knack for tackling stories tied to big, complex systems, and breaking down the concepts in a way that was understandable, relatable, and by tying it to compelling characters, even exciting. Whether it was taking us into the bizarre and dysfunctional underbelly of the patent system in the episode When Patents Attack, or looking at the role of money in politics, Alex Bloomberg frequently took on topics that, on the surface, wouldn't exactly strike you as potential riveting hours of radio, but they were. But it was during the 2008 housing crisis when he co-produced an episode called The Giant Pool of Money that Alex really made a name for himself with his ability. During those tense days when the housing market was in freefall, Alex and his counterpart at NPR, Adam Davidson, came together and asked some basic questions. Why was this happening? What were the causes of this sudden crash? And why were so many people seemingly buying houses that they couldn't afford? That episode was such a success, even gaining mentions in the halls of Congress, that it led to the spinning off of a new NPR podcast called Planet Money, tackling exactly such economic questions. Now, as I mentioned a few months ago, Alex Bloomberg left This American Life and Planet Money to undertake a new challenge, the goal to launch a podcasting network that would create a spate of great programs and figure out a way to monetize the form. Now, this interview that I'm bringing you today um, was a bit of a challenge, a challenge in that I actually recorded it last May, i.e. May of 2014, before Radio Waves had launched, and more importantly, while Alex was still a producer at This American Life, before he had announced any of his plans for Gimlet Media. And so this fall, while I watched everything change in Alex's life and explode with Gimlet Media and Startup, I kept wondering in the back of my mind how I was going to make this interview work, if I hadn't left it too impossibly late for it to make any sense. But then last week, I finally got in touch with Alex to see if he'd be willing to speak with me as a sort of follow-up, and thankfully, he said yes. So this episode, you could say, is a special Alex Bloomberg in two parts. First pre-Gimlet Media, and now post, or post eight months into him founding the company. So I'll be back later in the episode to introduce the second half of our conversation, the one I just recorded. But right now, travel with me, if you will, way back to May of 2014. And Gimlet Media was just a twinkle in Alex Bloomberg's eye. I started by asking Alex about a rumor I had read online that he didn't much care for Garrison Keillor or the Prairie Home Companion when he was growing up. You know, the, the honest truth is, I think I always liked Garrison Keillor as a kid. Did you? Okay. That's the, the, yeah, well, so I'm old enough to know, I'm old enough to remember when like Garrison Keillor was the new thing on on radio. Like I remember when he came on and I remember a little bit of like, you know, sort of this buzz of sort of like, oh, what's this? This is this guy who's returning this old form that's been long lost, sort of like the, 
oral storyteller on stage, you know, and bringing it back to public radio. And it felt very fresh and new. Which is so funny because as good as the show is, it doesn't exactly scream new, fresh and new. (laughs) No, but I think there's like, to me, I mean, and like when I started at This American Life, like, I I don't know, I, I wonder what Ira would say about this, but to me, it was a very, very clear line from like Garrison Keillor started the whole thing. Like if, if Garrison hadn't come along and done this on public radio, sort of like, like to me, I think he's like, I think Ira gets credit for sort of starting the whole storytelling thing. But, but to me, it's probably goes back to Garrison. Like he was the first person. I mean, he wasn't the first person. The first person was like Homer, but like he, he was the person that I remember as sort of bringing it back to public radio and sort of saying like, look, you, you know, this is really entertaining and people will tune in and listen to a guy telling a compelling story on stage. Um, so yeah, so I my first memory of Garrison Killer is like, is like I think a lot of people's first memory of Ira or or Jad on Radiolab. Like it was like, oh, th- that is new and different. And it, it's funny, like I it, you know, because I, I don't know when his show started, but it must have been somewhere in the early to mid '80s, which is probably when you know I was I was just getting into high school, probably at that point. So I was just starting to be aware of stuff like that. I think, yeah. So you were interested in radio growing up? Did you listen to other shows? Was this an actual sort of interest that you that you consciously had? No, no. I was uh, uh, my interest in radio only came later. I was I was interested in long form narrative journalism. Like I, I, you know, we had New Yorkers lying around my house, and I would, I started to read those when I was a kid, and I really liked them. And um, and uh, and then in college, I continued to do that. So so that was always something that I was like interested in. Um, but I never thought, I just never thought I could do that. Like, I was like, how did this, who, how do you get that job? That seems like an impossible, I didn't know anybody, you know, I grew up in Cincinnati. I didn't know anybody who went on to write for the New Yorker or was on the radio or anything. Like, they just seemed like, you know, I felt like I'll, you know, go to school and I don't know what I'll do. I'll be a dentist or something. I don't know. You know, I didn't know what I was going to do. So it was only like later I'm, so I moved after college, I moved to Chicago, um, and I hooked up with some people who had a little bit more of a cosmopolitan background, like they were actually from, well, I mean, this started at school, like where I met people who were like actually from New York and other big cities and like realized that the people who do that sort of stuff are just regular people. Yeah, you know? They actually exist. They actually of, yeah. exist and that's a job that people have. And, and so that started, but I still didn't think it could be me. And then, and then gradually I was like, well, I should just try it. And so I got an internship at Harper's sort of, I was teaching school, um, when I graduated from college, I, I got a job teaching school soon after I graduated, and and um, I was a middle school science teacher at a private school in Chicago. I did that for four years, and one of the summers, in, in during one of the summers, I did the internship at Harper's. I got the internship, and uh, so that was what sort of launched me on the journalism career. So, so you went to Oberlin for political science and yes. government. Yeah, I mean, it was the I guess poli, the poli sci major at Oberlin was called a government major, but yeah, that's that's what I was. It was just political science. Yeah. Okay. And was it that a subject you were genuinely interested in? Yeah, I thought I thought, I mean, you know, I had like a bunch of idealism about enlightened leadership and the role of government, and I sort of thought I wanted to be involved in policy, I guess, on some level. Um, but then you realize you start studying that stuff, and you realize like policy is it's all about politics <laughs> you know and politics is all about like you know mobilizing people and meeting people and glad handing and you have to have this kind of personality and like you know i just didn't like that is just not me at all like i was not i couldn't i, I just felt horrible like going door to door and working on campaigns and stuff like that just i was just not cut out for that sort of thing oh so, so you did get involved with campaigns a little bit like i signed up for some stuff and i was just like i was too chicken i was just like i just didn't like going up and talking to strangers and I just you I don't like trying to I don't like telling people what they should think sort of you know which ultimately is what it comes down to you know what I mean I I had this naive belief that like there was just a better way of doing things and if you could just explain it to people then they would like go along with it you know that like it was just people didn't know you know but obviously it's like then you realize and like no no they have a different theory about how things work you know than your theory and that's the whole problem. They're not going to uh, yeah. change that easily. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so then it's all about sort of like, you know, politics. And then it's about politics. And still, like, and, I, and you know, I, I respect people who do that. Like, I think it's a really, you know, interesting, important thing. But I feel like, to me, the people who are really, really successful at it are the people who, like, like it. Like, there's, like, there's something about, like, 
going out and just sort of like talking to people and trying to convince them and like, liking the game of it. There's a game to it that they like, yeah. And I think that it's there's something about there's a, there's a kind of personality. So and it was very clear that that's not my personality. I'm like shy and introverted, and I don't like I actually don't like talking to strangers very much. And you know, like I mean, which is weird that I would go into journalism to, for that. But I feel like journalism lets you. It gives you permission in a way. It gives you permission to talk to people, and then it also doesn't. You don't have to like. You don't have to change their mind. All you have to do is just get them to tell their story. So it's not like you have to you have to persuade anybody of anything. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. I just listened to the uh, the story about Jerry Springer, uh-huh. and and he he's definitely that type of uh, yes. a political guy. You, you talk about how you know before the show he was actually uh, this really charismatic and successful politician from yeah. your hometown of of Cincinnati. Yeah, absolutely. And he definitely like, he just loves. The people, you know, you can see it. Like Bill Clinton is that way too. Like he just loves the, you know, the, the, the politics of it, the meeting of the people, and sort of the inspiring of the people, and the bringing, you know, it's just sort of like there's people who just like love that stuff. Yeah. So. So so what were you thinking when you when you left university? Was like middle school uh, becoming a teacher sort of a, a plan, or, or how did that transition happen? Oh, I, I just there's no theory. I had not, I had, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. Like I was like. You know, it's like you you get out of college and you've been in school for your whole life at that point. And I just was like, I don't I don't know what I want to do. I'll get a job and food service and chill out for a little bit. I I was very very unmotivated <laughs> to like, for, and I think part of that was like Oberlin. You know, sort of like you know nobody knew what they were wanted to do at Oberlin, and then Oberlin sort of instills this like, very almost like anti-money thing in you and then i also graduated into the teeth of one of the worst recessions in history um up up until that point like i was it was like you know so this was like the the mid to late 80s 1989 is when i graduated and like that was like you know that was sort of like the that was like unemployment rate was really high and there was like there were no jobs and so it was like it was a tough going And and i just figured that's like what happens when you graduate from college is that like it's really really hard to get a job and you know you're sort of like you're bouncing around for a while and then the mid 90s started happening and i was living in chicago and then people would be graduating and then you'd be like and they were getting jobs for like 65 and seventy thousand dollars a year which at that time was a lot of money and like and i was like oh right i graduated at this really weird time like and if i had graduated just a little bit later i would have somebody would have offered me a job doing something that i wasn't qualified for instead of you know you know what i mean like that's so it's it, it all has to do with when you graduate do you think that was helpful um, in the end? Because if you had just gotten a, a great job right out of university, maybe you could have just gotten stuck or something or never really taken the leap? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I feel like it, de- I don't, it depends. Like, I feel like it might have like sent me off on a whole different path and, you know, who knows what I'd be doing right now. Um, you know, I think there are people who, you know, on the other hand, you can, you can get that great job and then, you know, bank a little bit of your money <laughs> and then it becomes it becomes a little bit easier to sort of make the transition although i didn't have any money anyway so it wasn't like i had any like to make my jump it was just sort of like whatever i'm just gonna go i'm already like a little bit in debt and i'll be a little bit more in debt but that's pretty much it you know so um i don't know it just seems so inevitable at this point that like what happened is what happened it's hard to imagine how it would have played out differently but i i think it I, I think if I'd graduated five years later, I think it totally would have played out differently. I'm sure I would have gotten some job at some writing for some startup somewhere. And, you know, that would have been the thing I did. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So when you became a middle school teacher, when you were doing this, were you sort of just, did you know the whole time that you were kind of biding your time until you went off onto something else? Or, or did you think that was what you wanted to do? Um, I wasn't sure. I, I, I like when I took the job, I thought maybe this is what I want to do. Maybe I want to be an educator. And this is now in Chicago? You you moved to Chicago? Yeah, this was in Chicago. And yeah, I thought, sure, this could be something that I would try to do. Um, And there is something to, like, I think being an educator has informed my journalism quite a bit. Like you, you you learn very, very quickly that your lessons have to be, you have to break it down really simply you have to start at the very very beginning and like that those were useful lessons they were useful for like journalism like I, I I really I love explaining stuff and that was you know sort of like one of the best parts of being a teacher sort of like explaining something to somebody in, in a way that they like they they get it you know and trying to make it entertaining so some of those early sort of the things that you have to do as a journalist 
you really have to do as a teacher <laughs> you know what i mean because like especially middle schoolers they're just like so they get bored so fast you, you can see the eyes glaze over you know, you got instant even, feedback i mean if, if it was only eyes glazing over <laughs> you'd be fine but it's like chaos like chaos happens <laughs> you know like they start talking and running and hitting each other and <laughs> poking each other with pencils and like then giggling and then it's just like the class is out of control the minute you lose their attention so it's like sort of like it's a desperate desperate need to keep people focused at all moments so which is useful training for like making compelling radio because like at any moment someone could change the station absolutely yeah yeah so um so that was so that but but i think and i i in the beginning i thought like i would maybe have a career as as an educator but i think i think really the thing that i always wanted to do was try to be a journalist like that was the thing that i think if i was honest with myself from the beginning that's what i wanted to do i loved reading it i loved reading journalism i loved like that was the thing I loved, you know, I loved reading Harper's Magazine. I loved reading The New Yorker. I loved reading, you know, these long sort of thoughtful articles by people who went places and had interesting thoughts and saw interesting things and explained the world in sort of a deep contextual way. And I just, that was the thing that I loved. And so um, it was just like a long process of sort of like realizing that maybe I could try to do that myself. Like it just, it went from like, well, that's an awesome thing that exists that I would never be able to do that to being like, well, somebody does it to being like, well, maybe I could do it, you know? And so that was happening while I was teaching. So like I originally went into teaching because I was thinking, well, that might be the next best thing. That's the thing that I would be capable of. So it was just over that time of just feeling like a little dissatisfied and a little like I wasn't actually trying to do the thing that I wanted to do. Um, I mean, which you can get really deep. I mean, it was basically like, it was basically like fearing like I, I didn't try because I was afraid that I would fail, but you can't just, like I realized like, well, I could just be doing that my whole life, like just not trying something because I was afraid I would fail at it. Uh, and I would have done that my entire life, I'm sure, <laughs> except uh, my girlfriend dumped me. Uh, and then that was like, that was sort of catalyzed a bunch of stuff. Like I, I feel like, um, like she broke up with me and she moved to New York to follow her dreams and, uh, and I was like, oh my God, she's following her dream. She's going to get famous and I'm going to be supervising recess. <laughs> and, and it was just like, I mean, part of it was that basic, you know, sort of like I'm going to get dusted, you know, uh, and I'm just going to feel bad about myself for the rest, of the, the rest of my life. And I feel so horrible right now that like failing doesn't, like I couldn't feel worse, you know, like that's the thing about it really great breakup where you're just sort of like totally laid low and you're crying all the time and you're just like miserable and you feel like your life is over like the good thing about it is that like everything else you were afraid of seems like small by comparison and so like you're just like well i was afraid of that but i might as well you know try it now yeah. you know like this is as bad as it's gonna get so it gives you permission yeah. to take the risk I guess. <laughs> yeah exactly because nothing is gonna feel as bad as you feel right now anyway so um you might as well distract yourself with another bad feeling um so so that's sort of how it how it worked um and I think that was like, you know, if she hadn't broken up with me, I don't think that was clearly like a turning point in my life. I don't think I would do what I'm doing right now if that hadn't happened. Really? It was, it was that uh, sort of seminal? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like it just made me a lot more honest about like what I was afraid of and like being okay with experiencing that fear and experiencing the failure of it and stuff like that. Like I was just I was sort of living. I was like chickening out a lot of stuff. So, yeah. And and so at that point, is that when you give up teaching and, and then do you do the, the Harper's internship? Is that so, is that the... So I'd done the Harper's internship, but then... Before school or... I'd done it during the summer while I was teaching. So like I had the summers off. So I did it during the summer while I was teaching. And, and so I, you were in your late 20s or I was something? in my late 20s. Got back. I think she broke up with me that year. And I'd been sort of toying around with going to graduate school. So I had like sort of like an escape plan also. Like I, I was like, I knew that I didn't want to keep teaching. Like I knew that that was like not the thing I wanted to keep doing. Um, then she broke up with me. And then that's when I was like, well, screw it. You know, here's what I should do. And then around that time, there was an opening at This American Life. Just This American Life had just started. And a lot of the people from Harper's were sort of like involved with This American Life. There was this guy, Paul Tuff, who was... Um, an editor at Harper's who was involved at This American Life. And, um, who else did the Harper's internship? Paul Tuff did, yes, exactly, yeah. Um, also Canadian. Um, and uh, 
So I th- sort of through him, I like, I didn't, and sort of like I was in Chicago and I was in Chicago. So I sort of like, he was on the scene basically. But so I got basically an administrative assistant job at This American Life. Like, right, like this is right when it started, like in 95 or something? 97. So this is like October of 97, I think is when I started. And so it had been on, it had been around for like, it started in December of 95, I guess, right? So, so it had been on the air for like a year now, a year and a half. And, and it had already, you know, achieved some acclaim. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it was like still three people. Um, and were you a fan of the show? Had you had you listened to it? I had listened to it a little bit. I'd listened to it. I'd heard about it. And like Ira was on the radio in, in Chicago. He did this thing called The Wild Wild Room. Uh, and a bunch of my friends liked it. And I was always I like, yeah, I like it okay. But I like, it was like hit or miss. And I'd heard a couple of the missed ones. And then, and then I listened to like a couple of the good ones. And I was like, oh, that's why everybody likes it. Like it was really, it was like orig- it was early This American Life. He did this great story about getting his haircut, which was like really, it was great. It was really funny. And yeah, it was all about, he had a ponytail and how is he got his ponytail cut off finally. And it was really? Like, yeah. he ha- Ira had a ponytail. Ira had a ponytail and he did a story about getting his haircut. It was good. It was really good. And then I'd heard, uh, and then I'd heard him on the radio one time. And it was like one of those moments where I was like, what is this? This is, this sounds different than everything. And so... So I knew that, and that was exciting. And then I started, once I was working there, I started listening to the stuff that they're doing, and they did some really early episodes that were great. Like there was this Elise Spiegel story called Pray, which was about her going out and hanging out with evangelical Christians in Colorado Springs, and sort of like, that was really good, and sort of like was really interesting and weird. And and so while I was there, I, I was the administrative assistant, so I opened the mail and filed papers, and you know I didn't do very much editorial, but because they were so understaffed, and because they were trying to get out these like sort of like highly produced things every single week, I just got drafted into doing stuff. And so I ended up producing a show called The Harold Washington Show, which was one of the early shows about the first black mayor of Chicago, Harold Washington. And we did that. It was like an hour long documentary that we did. And I, I was sort of the quote unquote producer on that show. I didn't know what I was doing, but like I was like, you know, trying to figure it out as best I could and booking the interviews and stuff like that. And they didn't have anybody. So I was doing it. So so that was got me, got me my first experience doing that. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm ready now to become a producer. And I went to Ira and I was like, can I be a producer? And he was like, no, I don't, I don't have, I don't have any money to hire you as a producer. And I, I don't, I need an administrative assistant, you know? And, and he was like, and even if I did have a job, I wouldn't hire you because you don't know what you're doing yet. I was like, what would you need me to know to become a producer? And he was like, well, you should probably like freelance more stuff, like become a, you know, start freelancing journalism. And so... So I was like, okay, that's what I'll do. And so I said, okay, so I'm going to quit in a month and do that. And I went to my parents and I was like, here's the deal. I'm going to try this for a month. I mean, I'm going to try this for a year. Can you float me some money while I do this? And so I worked out like, I think we agreed on like $10,000 for, for that year um, that I would try to live off of and then try to make generate money. And I was like assuming, like I was like, it's cheaper than graduate school. So let's see if this is, can be my postgraduate year. Um, and then I was just like going to take that money and try to make a living. And so, and that's what I did. And like, basically at that point, like I was able to, then I just started hustling for money. I quit everything in January and I started like just hustling for freelance and like was writing magazine articles and doing freelance radio stuff. And I just, I still had my key card at WBEZ. So I'd go in there and use their equipment and like, you know, just doing the whole, I was like that kid who was hanging around the studio trying to do freelance assignments. Um, and I did it for a year and a half. And by the end of that year, I was like, oh, this is going to be my life. Like I'm, I was making it. I was like, I was like, so it's pretty quick then that you, you, it started to actually work. It started to work. It was totally working, you know? And like I had, had, I'd been pitching ideas at this American life the whole time and being like, they don't like them. They don't, I don't understand what story is. And then finally I pitched an idea that they were like, no, that's a story. And I was like, oh good. And so I actually did that. So actually one of my first freelance jobs was a story for this American life. Um, and then using that, I was able to get more stuff. And then I just became, you know, it's like, you know, you learn, you know, <laughs> over that year. And then like money is a really powerful motivator. Like I was just like, I needed to be really productive because I was, you know, like I needed to pay the bills, you know? And so you're just like hustling, you know? Um, and it was like a really desperate year. Like I remember like, you know, several times just sort of like waiting on the checks, you're waiting on the checks and like, like I'd been waiting, they were like, it's in the mail, it's in the mail. It just would not arrive. And then like when, and then I remember I just really needed the money and I went and I opened my mail. I was like, it has to be there. And I opened it up and it wasn't there. And I like literally broke down crying because <laughs> I was just sort of like so desperate for like the money and also just sort of the validation of the check. Um, but, uh, 
but by the end of that year, I was able to, I was like sort of cash positive, you know, um, and I just figured that would be the thing. And then they, at that point, they had a job opening at This American Life. And I'd gone so far, I was like, no, I don't, well, I don't, I don't want that job. I'll just keep freelancing for them. You know, that was going to be my life. And then my cousin was talking to me. He was like, well, are you sure you don't want to apply for the job? And I was like, oh, I guess I do want to apply for the job, don't I? So then I applied for the job and then I got it. So that was, the, that was how I got it. But I, like, I'd, I'd already sort of come in my head. I was like, I'd moved beyond that. Like, I was like going to do something. I was going to be like a freelance writer and get a job at a magazine and eventually write a book or something like that. That was going to be my thing. So you were you weren't necessarily in love with radio compared to like writing, which you had grown up with. Yeah, I'd done well. I was doing both, you know, and like I was doing I was doing both radio and writing. I'd I'd been writing for a couple of national. I'd written like an article for Wired, which was my first big sort of like writing assignment, and I'd like written like a sort of a little essay, humorous essay for GQ. So I'd gotten those national magazine checks, uh, but I'd also done a bunch of radio reporting, and so I'd gotten this like I I did this documentary for sound check which was like a public radio documentary series and um and it was about this these sort of like hospital medical ethicists who like are making these medical ethical decisions in the hospital and i'd followed this guy who was a medical ethicist and also a doctor and through this like particularly trying case of this guy who was dying but they weren't sure if he was dying and i just got this really great access to his daughter and her story and she was very very forthcoming and so it turned out to be a really great piece and that i was doing that at the same time and sort of cutting that together so so it was both but that piece was way more fun and way I felt I felt better at that than at the writing and so so I think I, that's when I was starting to realize like oh I like radio better one thing I noticed in the early stories you did uh, at least the ones that really stuck out with me is there there seems to be a, a, a theme of people divided against themselves sort of you so you have like Jerry Jerry Springer who you know on the one hand really wants to do progressive politics and, and cares about it on the other hand he's than this completely different course. There's the the bank robber, uh, this multi-millionaire um, guy who just like didn't like the life he was leading, um, and then he like robs a bank almost. He he claims kind of subconsciously almost like he wasn't even aware of what he was doing uh-huh. uh, as a way to escape that that life of, of being overworked. And there's like a couple others, but uh, it's interesting because it seems that that is parallel to, to your experience uh, leading up to it in, in a way. Do you think that there was anything about what you were going through at the time that made you interested in those sorts of characters? I, I, I never thought about it that way. Like to me, it was just sort of like the, the internal conflict is just good for the radio. Like you need, it's like, that's one of the, that's one of the things that radio can really deliver that other media can't as well. Like where you have somebody who's like sort of arguing against themselves and they can voice that sort of argument, that internal argument, or you can at least illustrate it a little bit. Um, Conflict is great, you know, and internal conflict is great. Um, and not many things can represent internal conflict the way radio can. So, because you can get people to sort of voice, you know, on the one side I'm feeling this and on the other side I'm feeling that. And that's just powerful, you know. So, but I think, yeah, but I think I, I, I am a person who just has a lot of doubt about everything in general. Like I always, like I'm constantly having that kind of dialogue in my head, you know, and I don't understand how other people seem to have such certainty about the things they do. So, uh, so perhaps in that way, I'm drawn to that kind of story because like, I feel like that's the kind of story that's, that's how I am going through life. So, yeah. Yeah. It seems to be a trend with like, uh, you know, Jonathan Goldstein and talks about the same sort of thing. And I've heard Ira yeah. Glass say, say more or less the same, uh, David Sedaris. Do you uh-huh. think there's something about that quality of self doubt that almost, um, predisposes one for, for storytelling? I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's like one of the, th- I think it's a quality that you find in a lot of journalists. I think they're just curious and they're. I think that's what gives people like that make what's what makes people sort of curious about the world and curious about people's motivations is because you know your so your own motivations are so constantly shifting and suspect and confusing. Um, so and if you're in touch with that in yourself, it's easier to get in touch with that in other people. Um, and I think everybody feels that way. I think just some people are like have have access to the and are and find it more comfort find it comfortable to live with that ambiguity and other people don't um so but i think it's definitely a trait that journalists have that that's you know they're like they they prefer gray <laughs> to black and white um so and that's why they want to that's why they want to report because they're like well what's you know what's that's what reporting is is trying to figure out like what's going on here you know, and either factually or interiorly, you know, or, uh, you know, on the inside. So what you've become best known for, I think, uh, is sort of these 
you're looking at these big systems, these like sort of interplay of, of interests, you know, things like the giant pool of money where you're looking at the mortgage crisis. Um, but I was interested to see that started even earlier. You, you looked at things like uh, standardized testing and how this affects teachers mm-hmm. and, uh, and the power of money in politics and, and the interplay of that. And, and what's interesting is in all these cases, it's like there's a bunch of people involved um, and they're sort of all kind of cogs in this much greater machine and not even conscious of this greater machine. Like mm-hmm. Same with the, uh, the Planet Money t-shirt even. Um, and uh, I, I was wondering, is there something specific about that? Have you just always, like, does that go back to the politics, uh, your interest in politics that makes these stories so interesting to you? I mean, I th- part of the, you know, so I was like, when I first got to college, I was going to be a physics major. And then I shifted to the humanities because you got to read, you know, more. And so I took an English class and I was like, I like reading novels. <laughs> it's way, way better than solving problem sets. So, but I think that, but like some part of my brain always wants to figure out the system. F- physics is all about the system, the rules that govern, you know, the behavior of, you know, sort of waves and objects. But, uh, but it's but the rules that govern people's behavior, and so I feel like I've always been interested in systems, um, and like that's how I. It's a good way of making sense of the world, and so, and and I don't. Like, I don't really believe in intrinsic good or evil, and I think people have it within themselves. Everybody has it to some extent. Some people are predisposed towards one or the other, but like everybody has it within themselves, and if the system is right, they'll behave in a certain way more easily than if they, than others. So so I so that's always what I'm looking for and so I've always been a little bit opposed to the sort of like look at how bad that is, you know, like that that person is doing, you know, that this greed must be stopped or whatever. Like they're so greedy. I'm like of course they're greedy. Everybody's greedy. like greed exists. Like you're never like what are you expecting, you know? Um Look at how selfish, like, of course they're selfish, you know? So so I feel like that's always been like, I, I guess in retrospect, I was surprised I actually did that recently. I went back and I was like, oh yeah, look, there's, you could see it all the way back. You know, like I was like always, I didn't think of, I thought of the giant pool of money as sort of like a watershed moment for me where I like switch sort of focus. But actually, if you do go back, you're always like, what what happened? Like, what were the rules that sort of like made the people behave this way? So yeah, so I think that's what it was. Like, I like the idea. I like figuring out, telling the the human stories, but sort of like figuring out the larger context in which they're behaving that way. Were you ever stuck in a situation like that where you felt sort of a cog in part of this this greater machine where you had to behave either like ambiguously in ethics or just with your own sense of what's right? Um, that's a good question. I'm trying to think. Uh, I mean, I, we're all pow- like, you know, my first couple my first job was in like social service i was a social service bureaucrat you know and i was working nine to five and it was like this day job where like people would line up and um i was working with russian refugees and russian refugees are sort of like russians they were coming from soviet russia and like which is like the system is everything like the system you manipulate the system to get what you need and like nobody understands that better than russians like they are like you know the system was crazy and like in order to do anything you had to sort of figure out like who's motivated by what and make them make it work for you and like i was i was the system to them <laughs> you know like i was this bureaucrat who had to like who could give them stuff and i didn't have anything to give them so like they were trying to manipulate me in ways that they thought i had secret jobs for them and they, they had to like bribe me or whatever to get those jobs and i didn't like that was i was honest in that way but like there were times when i was just sort of like these you know these guys aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and I would get mad at them or like I would be mad that they'd be late and I'd be mad that they weren't like showing up for the like paperwork that they were supposed to show up for and there's like this this whole bureaucracy around what they're doing and I remember like this guy like there was all these welfare rules for them when they came that they had to come into town and sign up and then go back home and it was like this guy had missed his appointment and I was like why did you miss your appointment and he was like I you know I was like I didn't have the bus fare and I was like come on you didn't have the bus fare and he was like and he just like talked me through his budget and he was like here's how much money i make and it's like it's th- it's like five dollars to come in and five dollars to come out and that's five dollars that i have i've already accounted for this whole month that's all i have you know and i it, it, like and then i was like oh right and you're like i have not been thinking about your needs at all like you don't have five dollars to spare and i'm act- i'm mad at you for not sparing that five dollars so i guess in that way sort of you know like i was like i was behaving i was incentivized to be a bureaucrat and i was behaving like a bureaucrat for sure yeah it's it's interesting in in looking at, at these these big stories in that 
it, in a way, it's, it's sort of a triumph of your in, original interest in policy, because what's clear in all of them um, is that, you know, policy does matter. It almost matters more than the the thoughts of the individuals involved. They're the, the individuals, uh, in a way, are sort of at, um, just at the will at these, these larger forces, in a way. Uh, in doing these stories, do you ever... Do you ever wish you could actually like change the policies? Because in some cases, it, it seems so. You almost get angry at the, at the listener, like at how outrageous how how the system is constructed is. But, well, like like what are you thinking? What are you imagining? Which one? Like what are you like the giant pool of money? Is that what you're thinking? Like what 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 part of it were you angry at? Well, the one that's most recent for me is um, thinking about. Uh, Oh, it, it was called Inside Job, the, oh, yeah. the show. And I forget, what's the name of the company? Magnetar. Magnetar. So Magnetar was this uh, organization um, that saw the crisis in the housing uh, market coming. This is like in 2005, 2006. And they actually schemed to sort of double down on it. So they, through investing in these awful CDOs that were doomed to fail sort of in the, in the most risky part of them, um, they took out huge bets against them. Um, which then worsened the overall crisis. And they made a lot of money from doing this, right? And it hurt, you know, the world economy. This had real consequences. And, you know, simple regulation could have prevented this sort of betting against the system and sort of um, building something up in for the intent for it to fail. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what to do about those guys. Like, I mean, clearly, I don't think I would like them probably you know i don't know if we would share the same values we don't like we don't care about the same things like sharing the values whatever that means but i I don't think we care about the same things like i'm more interested in certain things and they're more interested in other things but like i never i never knew what to think about them and like and even there i'm not sure who to be angry at like there was lots of regulation and like and then the regulation happens inside this political system where it's like you're never it's just it's really complicated to me and i just like i don't like I, I don't know who to get mad at like i honestly don't know like i feel like well there's almost no one to be mad at specifically yeah. um because everyone was rational actors but everyone yeah. acting rationally uh leads to inevitable doom if right. it's not if the system isn't properly checked and balanced yeah and i think and i think there's also sort of like so and and then culture does play a role like i feel like there is a culture where it's totally fine to think like you know, we're going to win and we're going to win by screwing those suckers who don't know what's coming in. We're smarter than them and we're going to like make a ton of money and not really thinking about the consequences of that for, you know, everybody else, which I'm sure is what was happening in some of those places. Like there's a Wall Street mentality, I think, which is sort of like, it's just, a, you know, it's a big game and who's good at the game and bad at the game and who's winning and who's losing. And like, you don't really think beyond that, um, which everybody does, you know, like to a certain extent. Um, so... I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know what to like. I like, that's the thing is that the more I look at this stuff and the more I study it, like there, like we did talk to a lot of people on wall street and like, nobody was like, a, there's some, there's some, you know, there's some assholes for sure. But like, I don't know. Like there wasn't like, there wasn't, there wasn't anybody who felt like there wasn't anybody who felt like you're a, you're a villain necessarily. Nobody like was, um, scheming to bring down the world economy, you know. But again, uh, it, it was yeah. it was the policies. It yeah, wasn't no, like. But, but even the policies, and then the policies are sort of like every like a lot of the things that happened. So if you go back far enough, like, and this was a story that I always wanted to do that we never, I never just got got it together to do. But like, there's a version of history which is sort of like this all goes back to housing policy, you know, and sort of regulations that have been were put in place you know, ostensibly to help middle Americans buy, middle class Americans buy homes, you know? And so there's like, so you, you know, you change the regulations a little bit so that like, you know, you, it makes it easier to, for people to buy homes. And then because it's easier for people to buy homes, more money goes into home buying, which, which over the course of decades makes home prices seem like they always rise, which m- makes home related assets seem safer than they otherwise would seem, which creates this you know, sort of illusion that houses are always a safe investment, which leads to this sort of like situation where the entire, that whole edifice was built on the idea that like, you know, because they were housing related assets, they were safe and housing related assets seemed safe because of like, you know, 
decades of policy that made them seem safe totally unintentionally. So like, but there was some intention bes- uh, behind it because you talk about uh, in in the later in a later episode or early episode, yeah. you talk about uh, the influence of, of money in politics. But even then. Yeah, but yeah exactly. And, and, and if, if, yeah. if it's, and I think it's Barney Frank who points out, it's like, well, you know, it, it has an effect, but it only has an effect on things that like voters aren't, don't actively have a position on because right. it's like too complex or too, you know, uh, detail right. oriented. And that's what a lot of these policies were. It was, wow. it was stuff that was really hard to understand and no one took an active interest in it besides right. the people who stood to make a lot of money from them. Like, yeah. you know, not regulating uh, derivatives, for example. Yeah. You know, that was an active effort on the behalf of large interests to make sure that they weren't regulated. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I feel like there's like a, there's, there's a, um, no, there's no question about it. And, and like and like money in politics is there's like I, I feel like, you know, our political system is like a bizarre system. If you like step back and look at it like it is like it does seem in some ways to be somewhat institutionalized bribery. <laughs> like you're like going and soliciting money from the people who you're creating policies that will affect. So um, but uh but I, you know, so like, I, again, like I've just like, it's man talking about fixing the system though. It just feels like there's so many, where do you start? Who, what's the thing that you start with? All that sort of stuff. Like, I don't know, you know? Um, so yeah. So, so I feel like it's like, do you almost feel hopeless? Like looking at these things, like you, you were a policy wonk. Like, do you, are you energized by it or are you just like, oh, it's impossible. I, I don't feel hopeless. Like the thing that I've come to think is that sort of like, it doesn't like, there is like regulation is there to make things safer but then the safety creates this illusion of sort of like safety like the the more people in the system are aware that there's risk in a certain way it's better so so i'm sort of feel like um these things correct themselves like and it it's a bummer that it took like it had to wipe out the global economy to correct itself and i feel like that's a problem but i feel like if there had been little or corrections along the way like i think that seems to be this there's always going to be like if you can just keep the crises to mini crises <laughs> that seems to be the thing like so i'm hopeful that people get it together you know like i'm hopeful that um people learn like the, the fact that everybody like all those bankers right afterwards were like oh we need we need some regulation here. Like people were telling us that, you know, like it's like this yeah. lesson we've learned so many times in the past, like yeah. the savings and loans uh, crisis, savings and loans crisis, rather, and you know, right up to the <laughs> leading up to the the Great Depression and all the ups and downs and crashes that happened before then. No, I know, and I, I, and like that's yeah. I mean, I guess so. It, like I guess like so that's what I feel like. I feel like we're like super. We're like I've come around to feeling like we're really flawed creatures, and we are gonna like fuck things up over and over and over again um but we haven't like wiped ourselves out yet so hopefully we'll keep on <laughs> you know like hopefully like that's that's my optimistic way of thinking about it is sort of like we're all we're like we're we're stupid and we don't necessarily learn the lessons we don't the lessons don't last yeah we yeah. we learn them for like 10 yeah, years yeah, and then yeah. it's gone yeah yeah totally and, and listening to these different stories that you've done over the years one one i particularly like is the patents which is equally as outrageous this the system that was originally designed for great purposes to help innovation because of weird laws over the years or just institutional change it's become the exact opposite where it hinders innovation and people are just suing each other for no for no real reason or with no not much of a real rational claim um but in listening to all these i you know you mentioned we haven't destroyed ourselves yet but i kept thinking about climate change because it's the same sort of thing where it's like you know everyone's acting rationally in in the short narrow sense and we're all doomed to fail and unlike the economic crisis the the world can't um bounce back in the same way do you think about that at all has that been in your mind when you're doing these other sort of stories looking at the how systems interplay i mean climate change is definitely the biggest like climate change seems like the biggest threat and like for sure and it seems like we're heading towards a world where um you know like elizabeth colbert is like you know a world of rats and pigeons you know sort of like it definitely feels that way and and that makes me deeply deeply sad because i like knowing that there are polar bears <laughs> you know um even though i've never seen a polar bear and i probably never will i like knowing that they're there um or that there's manhattan <laughs> yeah i mean I'm florida not, i i'm I, i'm not worried about manhattan like that's the thing that i feel like that is the th- th- thing that i feel like uh, enough resources will be pulled to but yes people will figure out a way to protect manhattan um 
and and so that's the thing that like I feel like so um but you know like that's that no that's the biggest one like that seems like the one where it's like you know all the other like financial crises are going to come and go and we're going to figure out like you know we'll we'll like you know have these crises and then we'll figure out how to get out of it and we'll change our behavior for you know a decade or two um but like the yeah climate change seems like a big that's that's a real one and i don't know what to do about that and i feel like and i feel like there is a solution which is just make carbon more expensive like and and it feels like we almost did it and maybe we'll do it again, you know? So maybe, maybe we'll, maybe we'll figure this one out, you know? Um, but that, that would work. You know, I mean, people like people who study it will like, if you just make it more expensive, it'll work. People, everything's, you know, cause that's the thing that I've figured you out. Set the incentives are upright. Yeah. You said that, like, that's the thing is that the system can be created either, either way. And if you set the system right, then, it, you know, then people change their behavior, organize behavior, their behavior differently. So, um, so, you know, things pass, like people, positions change. I don't know. I, I, I mean, you can't do anything but take the long view, sort of, <laughs> you know, and I, and I got tired of being angry. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, that was part of it. It was sort of like, you can be outraged at everything, and then it's just exhausting, because it doesn't get you anything anyway. So, I mean, I, be, I have beliefs that should, you know, that's why I do the stories I do. Like, I do feel like, you know, this seems weird and probably wrong, so we should look at it, you know, or it seems like it's setting things up in the wrong, with the wrong incentives. Um, but, uh, but I can't, it, yeah, it's like the getting rid of the outrage has been, actually been really helpful because it allows you to sort of talk to the people involved with that judgment, which I think is helpful. Like, I don't want to judge the guys. Any, I don't want to judge people anymore for what they're doing. Um, and that, and I feel like you get better tape. <laughs> you get, you get better interviews. And so, and so that's been like, you know, you. I went to Overland, and which is all about like, that's judging. It's a big judgy school. You know, you're sort of judging people. That's what, like people said politically correct without irony when I was there. You know, um, and it's like, I think sort of studying economics has helped me be a little bit more compassionate to people. Like sort of like, we're like just responding to sort of like incentives in a certain way, and 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 I don't have to like judge everybody for it. <laughs> you know, it's sort of a relief. Yeah, well, it's the same with the the testosterone piece. It's like there's much more at play in causing our behavior than just we suspect or like our internal yeah. will or internal interest and stuff. Right. It's like in all of your piece, it's like, oh, well, we're kind of ants in a way. We're kind of like rats in a maze after the cheese. Right. But we're amusing. Yeah. We're, we're like we're amusing while we're doing that. Like we can we're funny and we're creative and we're trying to do things and we're trying to like and we're like dealing with the hand we're dealt. And like that's the thing, too, is sort of like. You know, there's people sort of doing these things that were like ultimately very harmful. Like, the, but they're like funny when they're talking about it. Like, the guy who sold the mortgages was funny. Like, he was a funny, interesting character, and he's like a funny sort of good guy. You know, so that's the other thing. It's sort of like I don't, I'm glad that I don't have to view him as a criminal. You know, now and like because I because I can just sort of take everybody for who they are. Sort of. Do you see an importance in this type of journalism? I mean, I've heard Ira say in the past, sort of, um, you know. There's a distaste for for earnestness uh, in the type of reporting that goes on at This American Life, or or at least uh, a tendency to not want to think of of it as important. Um, but it seems like this stuff is is important in a way because the only way systems or policies are going to change is if the general population, the public, has a understanding of these these systems and and wants them to change. If no one's paying attention, then you know it, these policies uh, about the the banking system are only going to go to the people with. Uh, vested interests who are paying attention. I, I I love explaining stuff. I feel like there's a value in making something clear that wasn't clear before. So for sure, I love doing that. Um, and like, and I think there is value in that. And I feel like that that to the extent that that was like helpful and sort of was like part of the debate. And like, I understood and like talked to, from talking to people that like the giant pool of money got passed around and like halls of Congress and policymakers and stuff like that. And that's exciting and really exciting, you know. Um, you know, we just did a story, got a guy out of prison recently. Like, you know, it was a story about like a, on This American Life, a story about this guy who was sort of like, he wasn't wrongfully, he was just, they never blocked him up and then he ended up living his life. And then- For 13 they, years yeah, and then- And then yeah. it came time to like release him and they were like, oh, where is he? And then they locked him up and then, and then you know, we did the story about him and like he'd lived this upstanding life for 15 years and so they let him out after that story. So, um, so that's exciting. But I don't think I think there's definitely a tendency among journalists to take themselves too seriously and think that their work is important beyond what it is. And and uh, 
and I also feel like the, I think there's definitely a, a trend I'm working against, which is like um, highly partisan, factless reportage, <laughs> you know, where I feel like confirmation, it, you know, uh, conf bias. Yeah. Yeah. Confirmation bias is the is the most dangerous thing in the world. I feel like that's the problem. And like and like liberals have it and conservatives have it. And like to the extent that I can sort of try to fight against that, like that's I like that. I like that as my role. Oh, and uh, final question. I mean, I, in one episode, I think the middle school episode, you you have a quick conversation with with Ira saying uh, about your own experiences trying to teach, um, you know, kids in grade seven or eight, um, and how you felt it was hopeless um, in, a, in a way, like just nothing got through. They were preoccupied with all sorts of other things, like who are they, and like growing up, and you know, the world around them. Um, and and now it you know you have become a, a teacher at a much greater scale using your sort of own. Uh, ignorance and curiosity to actually teach as as you learn learn yourself do you, would you do you feel like a teacher now in just like a much different venue or medium no, no no i would never call myself a teacher i'm literally like my main goal is trying to i think the main goal is trying to keep people interested that's all i'm trying to do i'm trying to tell a good story is like that's the main thing because like so and to the extent that i'm trying to tell a story that's like that people could learn something along the way yeah i guess so but I would never think, I never, it, like when I'm going through my life, I'm not like, I'm going to teach people something. I'm trying to learn things and I'm trying to bring people along as I learn them. But I would never, ever think of myself as a teacher. Te there's something about, there's something kind of dantic, but yeah, a different type of teacher maybe where yeah, you're learning as you I, go along. I mean, maybe an explainer, I guess, but sort of like the explaining thing is sort of, again, like to, you need a story and, you know, like you need you need some interesting characters and you need something funny happening and you need something interesting happening. And so, so to me, that's always the thing that I'm focused on most is sort of like, what's the, what's, how is this going to be interesting to people? And if, you know, and then, yeah, if there's some interesting facts in there or interesting things that I learned that I found interesting, like I definitely want to share that with people. And but, as you said that, like ignorance is your, your greatest ally in this endeavor. It is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're like a, you're like, the best, you, the, the, your role as a, as, a, as a radio reporter, I think even more than as other reporters, like you're a pretty smart person who knows no facts. That's, that should be your role because <laughs> you have to get people to explain it to you. Yeah. Well, you, you certainly have been able to uh, turn uh, wonky policy uh, systems into something really interesting from like the patents to the, uh, to the making of uh, T-shirts and international trade. So, um, so Alex Bloomberg, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much. It was really fun. And that was part one of my interview with Alex Bloomberg, recorded at the This American Life studio last spring. Now, as I mentioned, a lot has changed in Alex's life since then. Alex left This American Life and Planet Money several months ago to launch a new for-profit podcasting network that aims to be something like the HBO of podcasting, a premium provider for podcast programs that listeners will eventually pay to subscribe to or pay for extras. As part of this, he also created a podcast called Startup, documenting his journey as he tried to launch this new venture and get it off the ground. It drew on the storytelling skills he had built up after almost two decades of reporting, only this time he was the central character, and we the audience got to peer in and listen as all the ups and downs of starting your own company were laid bare. From pitching investors to choosing a name to burnout to doubt, it's been quite a ride. And not only did the podcast turn into a hit, but the whole project has done extremely well, with Gimlet Media far exceeding their early expectations. So a couple days ago, I rang up Alex Bloomberg to ask him how life looks eight months later, not only as a host of a hit podcast, but also the CEO of a brand new company. Well, Alex Bloomberg, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, thank you. Great to be back. Now, it's interesting. I spoke to you eight months ago, originally for this podcast, before it had become a thing. And it's been odd because since then, everything in your life has changed. Um, you know, since then, of course, you've started uh, Gimlet Media. You've created this uh, hit podcast startup documenting uh, your life making a startup. I mean, it's all happened so so quickly following the show. If you were to go back uh, to when we spoke back in, in May of 2014, and I, if I was to tell you what has happened since and how the company has done, I was wondering what your response would be. Like, w would you be 
taken <laughs> aback? Would you be shocked? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, uh, I would have been, yeah, I'm sure I would have been surprised. Uh, because I know I would have been surprised because I know what I thought would be. I have, I have a spreadsheet um, from that time that tells me what I, what my assumptions were about where we'd be. And, and, uh, it was nowhere like where we are. Like we were, I was, um, yeah, it's gone a lot better than I thought, than I thought it was going to go. My assumptions at that time were that we'd be really, we'd be far below where we are right now in terms of listeners. And we'd be far below where we are right now in terms of revenue. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's gone surprisingly, surprisingly well. I feel incredibly lucky so far. And what about just the general uh, shift that's happened in, in your life? It, like before, it was all imaginary. It was all in your mind of what this could potentially be. Um, the idea of making a new company uh, is completely different, of course, than actually going out and doing it. Yeah. Um, has there been anything that uh, you wouldn't have expected about about that, like of how it's changed your life? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I can't remember. At the time we talked, was I even talking about this company? I mean, had it May, I think I had- I think you- I'd left Planet Money already, yeah. Okay, but was I talking? Was I talking to you about it when we 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 talked? Did I did I mention, you know, my plans for the company at all, or or or, or not? No, you did. I didn't even tell you that I was planning on starting a company when we talked in May of 2014. No, we got a bit dis- distracted by the idea of policy, uh, but yeah, it, it hadn't. Uh, it didn't come up. Fascinating. Yeah, because I think I was at, at that point. I was. Uh, starting, I'd already been, I'd already quit Planet Money at that time, uh, in March of 20, 2014. And I had started going around looking for investment. So I think I was already, at that point, I'd already s- started trying to get the company off the ground. Um, but I probably wasn't talking about it publicly yet, just because um, it was still so theoretical. Um, but that's interesting. I didn't even mention to you the, the the possibility that there was an idea in the air. What did we talk about? Uh, we talked about your beginnings, how you first came to this American oh, okay. life, uh, being you know your internship at Harper's, and then we got into policy and how um, the the whole idea of how a lot of the documentaries or pieces you did at This American Life sort of look at these big systems. Oh um, yeah, 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 right. Like giant pool of money and yeah, yeah got and it. And patents. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, I think, yeah. So, I mean, at the time it was very, it was, I, I mean, I knew I, I, I was planning on doing this at the time. Like that was, I'd, I'd left Planet Money at the time we spoke and I, I was still working at This American Life, but I had, I was planning on, um, I was, you know, I'd already talked to them about, you know, that I was going to leave and I was going to try to start this company. Um, but it wasn't a, uh, but it was very, very, very far from reality. I think I'd made one investor pitch, uh, at all. And, and so, um, so the so yeah, it was all very theoretical, and now it's all very very real, and and it's different. You know, it's very different. It's very different actually running a company and and being in charge of, you know, that it's you know sort of making sure that it's going okay and being in charge and trying to make it grow and you know all that stuff. So uh, yeah, it's really it's it's crazy. I, I can't be, you know, it's funny. You know, my day to day life isn't that different. Like when we get off, when we get done with this conversation, I'm going to go out and talk with um, one of our producers and talk through tape. You know, and we're going to have an hour long meeting and we're just going to discuss tape. Uh, so, you know, that's what's going to happen. Um, and that's a lot of my day is still doing a lot of that stuff. But, um, but a lot more of my day is sort of like discussing long term strategy and what's our growth plan and who, you know, what what do we what things do we need to put on the calendar and what are our be- benchmarks and you know, you know, a lot of stuff like that. So um, it's it's quite different. It's fun though. And what, what percentage of your day would you like is now doing that sort of heading a startup type work compared to editing and being a radio producer? It, it was, it, what we've realized is that um, I think the most effective thing we can be doing right now is creating more shows uh, and creating more you know, as much great audio as possible. So, so for me, what that means is like doing the things that that I used to do before is 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 sort of essential to our core business. Um, so, so right now that that feels 
that feels like a good use of my time as CEO is is to sort of make sure that our core product, you know, these shows that we're launching, is that they're in good shape, uh, and and shepherding them along and helping with edits and doing all that stuff that that I've learned to do over the twenty years I've been in public radio. So it's not, you know, it's that's a lot of my time right now. Um, I'd say maybe twenty five percent of my time is spent, uh, or thirty percent is spent on other stuff of like. Maybe it's closer to half. It's probably close. if you ask my staff, they would say it was probably closer to half because they always want more <laughs> editing from me than I'm able to give. Uh, I feel like I'm trying to give as much to sort of like on the content side as I can. Um, and then the other stuff is sort of like you know, talking, meeting about numbers, meeting about you know, sort of like thinking in terms of strategy, sort of having meetings with people like about partnerships. It's a lot of meetings with people. Um, a lot of meetings in my life. It's interesting. One of the things that I've found really compelling about the the podcast, the startup podcast, is the, uh, the tension in your own motivations. Uh, for me, it doesn't seem completely resolved, uh, and I'll come back to that in a different way. But but first, like what what are you, you've said is one of the main things driving you is like you want to kind of make shows. You want to have the chance to to make shows and see a, a way for more great shows to come about. Uh, and I was wondering, like, if if it got to the point where the company became big enough where it just didn't make sense for you to be doing that, helping like weave the narrative threads or helping to edit uh, and was just doing like the stats and the meetings and like the strategy. Would you, would you enjoy that? Would that, would you feel like you had reached a spot that, that you enjoyed or would you miss that? I don't know. Uh, I think I'd probably, I think, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, uh, you know, as I've gotten older, there's parts of it that I used to there's parts of it that I used to love that I don't love as much anymore. And I start and I love the, the there's parts of the you know sort of the reporting storytelling process that I that I don't love as much as I used to. You know, I used to really like love getting out in the field and reporting and stuff like that. And and I like reporting. I still do. I still like getting out. But it's not. I, I think if I didn't ever do it again, I wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be the end of my world. Um, and you know the me of twenty years ago or fifteen years ago might be shocked by that now. So so I don't know. Like I you know there's it's you know it's fun you know the running the company part and the strategy part is is interesting and exciting and it's exciting you know you're building something like the thing that's nice about about making a show or making a story is that you're building something you know you're putting these pieces together and you're trying to figure out how they all fit together and how they work and and um. You know, building a company is sort of the same thing. You're you're exercising the same muscles, but in a very different way. Uh, and so, so to me, that's that's also sort of exciting. Um, but I, I I imagine that I'm always going to want to have a, a hand in something, some sort of editorial project. So, like, you know, knock on wood, we're lucky enough. Like in ten years, we have you know, we have a gigantic company, and I'm just a figurehead. They'll have some like project that like oh yeah Bloomberg he he's really interested in this I don't know cooking podcast or whatever and I'll be helping that or I don't know I don't know what it'd be you, you always have a pet project or something. I would imagine I don't I don't know it seems crazy to speculate right now so okay but back to that central tension because um, like in, in startup uh, you have these conversations for example with like one of the first investors Chris Saka like you know big uh, big venture capital guy from Silicon Valley and the tension is between like okay well you clearly are someone who cares about the story. Um, you came through public radio, which is about as least driven by profit motive as you can get in the world in terms of institutions. And uh, now you're at a startup, which or created a startup, which is obviously basically 100% more or less based on on profit motive. And the tension is like, well, how, how much do you actually care about the profit motive compared to just making great stuff? Um, and for me, it's not clear, like... it. I don't know. I hear like both different ends of it. Um, I, at I, some points, it seems like you really care about making something really big, and at other points, it seems like you really, you know, you wouldn't mind having just something medium sized. Um, so, w- where are you at with that that tension? Well, I would I would I would characterize it differently. Like, I, I the profit motive, I, I, I like I don't think it's that. Like, I don't like a lot of the greatest work that that I love the most is is, is made by companies you know, sort of that are operating under the profit motive. And the company that I worked, that, the, you know, the organization I used to work for, This American Life, which was like, yes, a not-for-profit entity, was was profitable. They always ran a revenue surplus every year. Uh, they brought in more money mm-hmm. than they spent. So uh, so to me, it's not about the profit motive because to me, profit is simply the thing that tells you that you're, that you're 
<laughs> that you're that you're doing something that's sustainable basically you know you you need to you need to be coming out ahead at the end of each year um, in order to continue to do the thing that you do otherwise you're just going to shrivel up and shrink so so to me it's less about the pursuit of profits we absolutely need to be profitable so the profit motive is very very much driving me but more about like what do we there's a gazillion ways to be profitable so and i think the most uh, to me like the most successful companies i don't know i think there's like this thing out there that like you're either driven by profits or you're driven by something else and there's and there's and it's very binary and and i think it's sort of the opposite i think nobody is purely driven by profit except maybe right i guess the institutional yeah. structure though. yeah well no even the institutional structure like there is like there is a gazillion ways to be profitable. So if we we're purely driven by profit, we would like go out and find the place where like what is the most profitable thing that we could be? Uh, it looks like a hedge fund. I'm going to start a hedge fund. You know, that's what I would do if I was purely driven by profit. Or it looks like, you know what I mean? I should be, you know, I should be setting up an options trading platform or something. I don't know. You know, something wherever the profits are highest. I should be starting an oil company. Um so uh so so I to me it feels like I, the the tension is about um, growth with the, the pace of growth. Um, and, and that's always been what the tension is. And that was sort of what the, I think what the shows are about is sort of like, I want very much to be a profitable company. I also want very much to do work that I care about. Um, and that's, and I don't think those are in contradiction with each other at all. Like I think, you know, I think, um, I don't want to do anything that doesn't feel like it could be that that's not something that I feel like is is of excellent quality or or that I'm not proud of. Like there's no part of me that ever wants to do anything like that. Like oh, I'm going to put this podcast up because you know I find it you know hateful or despicable in some way, but it'll make money. Like I, that doesn't seem like um, that doesn't that's not something that I ever want to be doing. Uh, and I think that's what makes successful companies actually is that they do have a vision. Of something that they're pursuing, um, that is differentiated, you know, for other people. So, so I, for me, it's like more about like how do we continue to build things that are sort of unified by that vision, um, and then how do we get those things that we're building to be as big as possible. Um, but the tension, I guess, you're talking about is sort of like in about the pace of growth, and that is something that's still very real. Like, how fast do we want to grow? Because, because that's the thing that sort of can take over your life. You know, this sort of rapid, uh, sort of like tech platform style expansion um, feels intimidating uh, to me. But I also think that, you know, not every company grows that way. So, you know, I, I, I to me, it was more about like the ex- expectations of our investors that were making me f- freaked out. That like, if I, if I grew more slowly, <laughs> then, you know, then their most successful companies, but that's still be okay. You know, that's that to, to me feels like the, the, the tension. And, and I think mostly it is okay. Right. Okay. Now I want to ask you about the actual podcast of startup. Uh, it's been interesting, of course, because you've been sharing sort of behind the scenes moments as you go. And there's been so much tension just with like the idea of will it work or not. And you've been very personal, I, I'm sure in a way that, uh, you know, you haven't been at This American Life since you were the reporter. Uh, I was wondering, has that has that been strange at all to be on the other end of of that process? On the other end of, of what process? I'm sorry, of like reporting and like you know finding moments of vulnerability and then reporting them yourself uh, about oh, your yeah. own, you know, sort of making your own narrative. Has has that been strange at all after doing being the merely reporter sort of yeah. uh, coming in and you know not having to give much of yourself? Yeah, it's been very strange. I mean, it's been really, it's. You know, it's been a it's been a very very odd thing to be sort of reporting on myself and and myself being the character, um, and I mean part of what's been hard about it is that like what makes a really really good episode is if I'm feeling very very anxious or tense or scared or upset about something. You know, like real honest emotion is is what makes an episode work. And but because I was the main central character, like that real emotion had to be mine. <laughs> so it was just. I was just like, oh man, like just like the, you know, on top of everything else to be worried about capturing those moments of tension or anxiety um, and then having to rely on them as like a way to make the episode move. Um, You know, it's like, it was hard. That was hard. Like I I knew, yeah, like, like it was just like, I'm glad that the, that the drama of our podcast does not have to 
that the ten- that the narrative tension does not actually have to continue to be tension in my actual stomach. <laughs> Um, what was it cathartic at all to to have that outlet though? Because a few times it seems like it actually helps, like with the burnout episode, for example, where it's it seems like do, the process of doing the podcast actually helped, um, yeah, the company or it resolved some issues. It was almost like a podcast therapy. Yeah, it absolutely did. No, uh, no, absolutely. Like I mean, and I think it has helped in terms of like what's well, helped both. I think in in connecting with an audience, obviously, because I think that the audience, like when it, you know, like. I was hoping that a lot of these feelings were universal and and or were sort of like more widespread anyway than 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 you know was maybe imagined and and that turns out to be the case like a lot of entrepreneurs and business people have been writing and saying like this is like you're you're saying what we've been feeling for a long time um but then you know with the burnout episode specifically it has been sort of like it's been nice to know like to have you know to have your words on tape and you can go back and listen to them and be like oh wait I didn't come off the way I thought I was coming off, you know, um, which is a thing they do in like management training. Since I've been to a management training before, and they like they they put you in a fake situation and they videotape you, and then you have to watch the videotape, and it's excruciating because you think you imagine yourself one way, and then you see yourself on videotape, and you're like sort of like being way less decisive and you know sort of using all these verbal tics that you thought you weren't using and all that sort of stuff, and so it's like. Um, but that's a fake situation and this was a real situation. So I actually got to go back and listen to myself, you know, not communicating the way I thought I was communicating and not listening when I thought I was listening. Uh, so it's really helpful. Have people responded to you differently at all? Like, or have you noticed um, just by virtue of them knowing you through the podcast um, and now having this like personal insight into your life? Well, people like I, I now get the thing that I think Ira God gets a lot and other people get a lot, which is sort of like the people who have ha- who have heard the podcast and connect with it when they meet me, they think they know me uh, because in some very real way they do. And not like in, a, in, in, in an obnoxious way, like, oh, those guys think they know me, but they, d- they feel this connection that they themselves recognize as sort of strange, but it's like hard to not feel. And I feel that way about people that I've heard on, uh, heard and loved for a long time where I'm like, I finally meet them and I'm like, oh, it's really you. Um, you look so different, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, um, so that's been happening a, a little bit more. It's not like very much, you know. But um, occasionally, people want to get their picture taken and stuff. That's that's been that's funny and fun and you know weird. Uh, but uh, not really. I mean, you know, it's not been. It hasn't been a huge change. No, I don't get mobbed at restaurants if that's what you're asking. <laughs> um, and what about your own like character? Because you're drawing on such a different uh, set of skills now. I mean, you still have the public radio storytelling type skill that you're drawing on, but you also have to be the CEO, uh, which I feel is, is a much different skill. And there is a difference. I mean, that one, f- that first bumbling pitch you you make uh, to Chris Saka, that was sort of uh, the heart of the the story. You know, now you come across in the audio as, as much more self-assured. I mean, the company's grown, so of course that that must help. But have you seen an identity shift at all within yourself uh, through the through the process? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think I think I am learning how to be a CEO, uh, and you know, trying to keep the parts of my personality and and my way of being that 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 would help that. And I feel like trying to stay non-defensive, trying to really keep your ears open and listen, trying to give, trying to support everybody, um, you know, and be, you know, and like trying to like do the things that I think made me a good editor. I think a lot of that stuff translates into being a good CEO. Um, you know, trying to keep people excited and unified to sort of going, going forward on, on the mission. Um, you know, all that stuff is good. I think where I've had to work is sort of like, um, You know, I think I was in, I think I'm, you know, I'm, I talk to process, I share a lot. And, uh, you know, I think, I think you can't, you can't share as much uh, when, when you're sort of, you have to figure out like you want to be transparent and you want to be as transparent as you can be um, with, with at the same time, you know, sort of like picking the time to reveal the information so that it's not going to like, so that you're not burdening people with too many things. Like, you know, I'll get off of, of a phone call and I'll be like, oh my God, you'll never believe this conversation I had with this stupid investor. And I want to share it with somebody, but I, I, 
All our investors are wonderful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but you'll never believe this conversation I had with this person, or you'll never believe like this. I had this uh, this person, you know, had this unpleasant thing to say to me, or whatever. And uh, you know, which would be which I want to share with people. You know, like I'll just want to like sort of say that. But like when you're the CEO in the company, and like then it has ramifications that that might alarm people you know or like might be like oh well, is that does that mean everything's okay and I've, everything is totally fine but like it's just this matter of like it's just realizing that like not i can't just share everything with everybody um right whereas the what makes great public radio is, is sharing yourself uh, completely yeah and, and and also just sort of like when you're when you're an employee you just you can you know I guess what I'm saying is sort of like it's it's harder to gossip as the CEO. <laughs> you know, when you're an employee, you can sort of gossip, <laughs> you know, and like you can be like, oh my God, I can't believe, can you believe our boss said this or can you believe our boss said that? And like, you can't do that when you're the CEO. You can't be like, oh my God, you know, so-and-so said this. Can you believe it? And they're like, well, you know, is that, you know, does the CEO say that about me or whatever? You know what I mean? Like, there's just not as much gossip. <laughs> That's, I guess, mainly what it comes down to. <laughs> can't gossip Well, it also occurs to me that, yeah. You know, it also occurs to me that, of course, you're basically like a coach leading their team into the Super Bowl. Yeah. It's not um, it's not a great time to demonstrate your doubt or uncertainty about the situation. Yeah, I think it's OK to be OK. I mean, I think it's OK to sort of be real and be honest, like that's fine. And sort of let's say this is this is going to be hard. And, um, you know, and here's here, here are the things that I'm worried about as long as you're doing it in a way that doesn't that isn't just sort of. As long as you're doing it in a way that's like giving people real information without having to spread your anxiety to other people that's the hard part is sort of like being i don't want to like i don't ever want to like you want to be i think it's i think it's a good goal to be to have everybody know everything you know um but you need it to be delivered in a way that's like working for them uh and sometimes you just want to share information because you're like i don't know what to think about this or this made me upset like i got this i got an email from somebody who's angry at me and i was like oh that makes me upset and I sort of wanted to talk to somebody about it, but you can't really talk to your employees about it because like, then you're like, Oh, I don't know. It's different. You know, you don't want to just, I don't want to, and sometimes you can, but you don't want to like, you don't want to share your, um, anxieties basically. It's different. Yeah. That's all that's different. It's not, it's, I feel like talking about it this much makes it feel like it's a bigger deal than it really is. It's just, it's me. Like it's basically me learning the lesson that I'm always learning, which is just, I should shut up more and probably <laughs> including right now. Well, I guess like it's interesting because so much of the tension, as you say in the, the final episode of this season of Startup, you know, w which was covering these first few months of, of the company, a lot of the main tensions have resolved, which for me, at least as the listener, is pretty remarkable given how short it, of a time frame it's been. Um, you know, like, can you raise money? Um, and will this thing actually fly? And so far, it seems like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's becoming a reality and it's doing really well. Uh, it seems like it's a, a big, well, as you say, it's a start and a beginning. And I was wondering, like, as you look forward, what are you most excited about uh, now in the next stage? And, and what are you most nervous about? Oh, I mean, uh, I'm I'm most nervous about, uh, you know, like, not not being able to continue to deliver, you know, <laughs> like, I'm most nervous about the thing that I'm always nervous about, which is failure. Uh you know, um, I'm I'm most you know, and I'm most excited though about just sort of like, yay! It's like this model seems to be working. You know, like the thing is working, and now we just have to build on it. You know, we just have to continue, uh, and you know, like that's really exciting. Like we have like we've set up a little home now, and we can and we can continue to expand, and we can you know make this like a big home for people to make lots and lots of great audio content and and like i feel like we're at the very beginning of sort of experimenting with the form and i think there's i think our next show out is going to be really really different and sound really different and feel really different and and i'm just really excited about continuing to make stuff that just feels weird and exciting um and you know fun for people you know so yeah and do you think you you would have got to this point without the the podcast like if you hadn't done startup uh, as part of the process, do you think you would have uh, things would be quite the same? Oh no, no way! I don't. I don't think if I hadn't startup, I, I don't know if we'd even have our money raised by now. Because um, startup was like it was very hard to con it was very hard to make people understand what the vision was. You know, even though you 
you know, even though I'd worked at This American Life and, and at Planet Money, it was hard to like say, but I want to do this again and, and it's going to be different. And, you know, and then once Startup came out, it was like people got it. They were like, oh, that's what you sort of want to do. And I get it now. And like people like that. And I could sh- point to it as like, look, it's got audience now. And so, yeah. So I think it was like, I don't, I, if we hadn't started, if I hadn't started with the Startup podcast, I don't think, I think things would have worked out very differently. I mean, that we'd be at a different spot. Yeah. And both you and Gimlet uh, become the protagonists in a way that we're all all cheering for. Yeah, I, I know it's really, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know it's been it's been really really great. Well, it's been a lot of fun to uh, to see it grow, and uh, I I'm excited to see what will happen next in in the journey. Thanks. And so, Alex Bloomberg, uh, thanks for joining me again. Thanks so much, Kevin. And that's part two of my interview with Alex Bloomberg, former This American Life producer and current CEO of Gimlet Media. And that's it for this episode of Radio Waves. As always, if you have any comments about the show or what you heard, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can reach me by email. I'm at kevin at thepublicradio.org. Or you can get in touch with us by heading to our website, radiowaveshow.com. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And a special request, if you listen to us in iTunes, if you could give us a star rating or write us a review, it would really be a big help and uh, give other people a chance to find out about us, hopefully, in the iTunes directory. Our music is by Poddington Bear and The Years, both found at the Free Music Archive. And our logo was designed by Joseph Nowak. Until next time, I'm Kevin Kaner.